Hello everyone and welcome to a quick lecture on this cell. Now this is going to be for general biology. Now what do we mean by a cell? So the cell is the basic unit of life. It's typically a small lipid membrane uh, lined uh, sac filled with cytosol. Uh, we can't have a living thing without it having at least one cell. The first living organism we know is a single cell and they serve many purposes and functions and are highly complex. There are two main classes, prokaryotic and eukaryotic, and there are two subclasses of eukaryotic cells, plant and animal. But for the purpose of this uh, intro lecture, we would just be learning about eukaryotic cells. So how do we classify a cell? There are many different interpretations that are correct, but in general, a cell derives energy from food molecules uh, or its environment and converts it into a biologically useful form we call this metabolism. Two, it can reproduce. Three, it can pass on its genes through nucleic acids for several generations. And four, it's composed of organic macromolecules containing carbon. Now, a cell is lined with a membrane, and we call this a phospholipid bilayer because there are two layers of a molecule called a phospholipid. A phospholipid is an amphipathic molecule, meaning it's subdivided into a polar region and a nonpolar region. Now, our polar region is going to be this hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. Now, a cell, a huge part of cells is uh, organelles. And an organelle is uh, unique and they have their own uh, kind of unique function. Now, organelles exist because each process they encapsulate or undergo requires a different chemical environment than the cytoplasm. So you can say that this mitochondrion has a different chemistry than the cytoplasm. So it needs to kind of fence it off from the rest. Otherwise, the cytoplasm is going to interfere with the chemistry that's going on here. It's a very high energy or low entropy, physically speaking. See, high organization. So some organelles arose via the endosymbiont theory, such as the mitochondrion, and we will be, uh, be getting into that. And most organelles are bound by a lipid membrane, such as the mitochondrion. Now let's talk about the nucleus first. Now the nucleus is only found in uh, eukaryotic cells. Uh, it's composed of two uh, lipid bilayers, collectively referred to as the nuclear envelopes. So we have the nuclear envelope here. Now, they're speckled nuclear pores, and you can kind of think, well, that's probably how things get in and out of the nucleus, and you'd be right. One of the ways that large proteins can exit and messenger RNAs. Uh, the center is called the nucleolus, and that's the site of ribosome production or synthesis. And then we call this the nucleoplasm. It's kind of the fluid where everything is suspended in within the inside of the nucleus. Uh, nucleoplasm contains genetic information in a condensed form known as chromatin, and you can kind of see it stained in the micro under the microscope sometimes. All right, now let's get into the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is composed of uh, two different types of reticula, uh, known as a smooth endoplasmic reticulum and a rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now the rough ER or endoplasmic reticulum is speckled with bo uh, bound ribosomes and they create extracellular proteins and we'll learn about different types of endo and exocytosis which can help you understand this uh, in the future. Uh, now the smooth endoplasmic reticulum has this kind of trabecular shape and it does not have any ribosomes. It's primarily involved in intracellular detoxification and, and lipid production for the lipid bilayer we discussed. It surrounds the nucleus and it's often continuous with it as well. So it's involved with the nucleus. Now the Golgi apparatus we'll talk about next. Um, it's kind of this highly stacked and folded uh, structure in the cell. It's composed of uh, primarily uh, phospholipid bilayers. It's a structure with many folds and it serves to modify proteins adding different functional R groups onto them before leaving the cell. And um, at the time this video comes out, I should have a video on R groups or functional groups, uh, important for biology. Uh, cis face, uh, that receives transport vesicles from the ER. Now, the ER secretes, remember, modified proteins uh, to the Golgi apparatus or any kind of protein that has been produced by the rough ER um, for extracellular secretion. And the Golgi goes ahead and, and modifies that through the lumen. Now the lumen of the, of the Golgi is here. And when it's done, it kind of travels and migrates outwards until it produces secretory vesicles. And they're called secretory vesicles because they secrete it out of the cell. They merge with the cell membrane and secrete the protein product. Um, and also indirectly adds on to the lipid bilayer. Let's talk about the mitochondrion. 
the mitochondrion is a highly folded double membrane organelle. Uh, they have their they have their own ribosomes and they're involved in the production of energy for the cell primarily. Uh, they reproduce independently of the cell, and they're thought to have arisen from the endosymbiont theory because of such. Now, the lumen of the outer membrane, which is right here, is called the inner membrane space. And the lumen of the inner membrane is known as the mitochondrial matrix. And the spaces in, in between the folds are called Christi. So right here, you have Christi. And they have their own ribosomes here. They're not, they're not identical to eukaryotic ribosomes. All right, now the centrosome is uh, it's kind of a fibrous structure composed of two centrioles, and they produce microtubules, which are a type of uh, protein dimer uh, for the cell involved in the cytoskeleton, which we'll talk about later. And uh, they're involved in cell division, uh, so mitosis and meiosis, they serve as kind of the two ends, the poles, make up the astrofibers and everything, but we'll talk about that later. They help maintain the cytoskeleton, and... The uh, microtubules extend from the plus end, uh, while the minus end gets shorter at the same time. Now the lysosome is a kind of a hydrolytic or um, kind of, I guess you could say, a structure that breaks down useless or old cellular components, including other organelles. So maybe the mitochondrion doesn't work anymore, it's damaged, and the lysosome will come in and kind of eat it, resolve it, or break it down, or hydrolyze it. Um, it merges with an organelle. So it often works in conjunction with the peroxisome to amplify its oxidative ability. No, it's, it's basically just a vesicle here. Now the peroxisome uh, is similar to the lysosome, but it contains oxidative species such as peroxide, which helps to oxidize older useless cell components, um, breaking them down. It often contains crystals within the lumen that you can see under the microscope. They contain the enzyme catalase, uh, which helps to catalyze excess peroxide, which can be harmful to the cell and that yields water and oxygen gas. That's why when you pour hydrogen peroxide in blood, it kind of bubbles up. And that's because it's releasing oxygen gas, the peroxisomes that contain the enzyme catalase. Now lastly, we have the ribosome. This is composed of two subunits, the large subunit and the small subunit. So the large here and the small subunit. Uh, uh, it's involved in the formation of peptides, the translation of messenger RNA, so it runs through here, and then we have the peptide. We have the free ribosomes that are scattered throughout the cytosol, and they produce uh, proteins for the actual cell. Remember, we talked about bound ribosomes, they're bound to the rough ER, and they produce extracellular proteins, which are secreted through exocytosis. Uh, I want to talk shortly about the fluid mosaic model, and we'll talk about these different types of proteins later, but remember, this is the phospholipid bilayer. And they have proteins within the membrane. It's not just the membrane. We have proteins within the membrane that do different things. They allow different things to come in and out. Um, we'll talk about diffusion later and transport. Now, the endosymbiont theory, last week, I wanted to talk about uh, how uh, mitochondrion and the endoplasmic reticulum arose. Well, this theorizes that many membrane bound organelles arose by phagocytosis of a prokaryote or enfoldings of the membrane. And this kind of explains why the mitochondria or nucleus ha has a double membrane. It also explains why the mitochondria have their own ribosomes and their ability to reproduce independently. So the theory goes we have a proto-eukaryote or maybe a prokaryote that uh, has kind of gobbled up a, a mitochondria uh, or uh, it used to be a bacteria, we think, a prokaryote. And it became an integral part of the cell. The cell didn't actually eat it. it We've, or the, the cell realized, well, it can produce energy for us in very large concentrations, a really densely packed energy source. So it might be beneficial, so we call that uh, mutualism. Now the endoplasmic reticulum, we used to have like maybe infoldings of prokaryotic membrane to increase surface area, and we kind of had that as an integral part. So maybe another uh, cell digested one that had infoldings of the plasma membrane and that became an integral part of the cell. And when you think about it, it explains why the nucleus has two membranes. Well, because to digest or uh, engulf something, you have your own membrane surround it's uh, another membrane, and that stays there when it comes in. So it has two membranes, and you can think, well, well, that's why there's two membranes of a mitochondria. And that's why they can reproduce independently, because they have bacterial genes, and that it's an actual cell. 
uh, may not be alive anymore, but we can see many um, pieces of evidence that say it used to be a cell. Well, that was pretty much it for an intro to cells, and I really hope this helped you a little bit. And uh, we will be talking about all the um, important parts or important processes that go on that will help you understand how all this stuff ties together. And that's the whole um, kind of premise of the uh, first part of general, general biology is understanding how all the parts of the cell communicate with each other. Uh, I will see you guys in the next one. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye.